we're going to pick up here on pulmonary ventilation. And breathing is pulmonary ventilation. So we talk about ventilation, like the ventilation of, of your building or you know, air ducts. It's all about airflow. But pulmonary ventilation is airflow into or out of your respiratory tract. And it's all dependent on changes in volume, which affect changes in pressure, and that can affect airflow, right? So earlier we learned about how blood only flows from high to low pressure. Same with air. Air flows from high to low pressure. So you can change the pressure of your thoracic cage inside your thoracic cavity, then that can actually affect air flow in a variety of ways. It all relates to something called Boyle's Law. Okay, so what happens is that Boyle's Law tells us there's a relationship between volume and pressure. And the relationship is that volume is inversely proportional to pressure. So if you increase your volume, you're going to decrease your pressure. And if you decrease your volume, you're going to increase pressure. And when I, talk, when I talk about volume, guys, I'm talking about volume of your thoracic cage because we know the thoracic cage itself, like your ribs and your costal cartilage, that it's extensible, it's expandable, and so that if you can expand your thoracic volume, you make the volume inside your thorax larger, what happens to the pressure then? You decrease pressure inside your thoracic cavity. Good. If you call that intrapulmonary pressure, or pressure inside your lungs, lowers because you make the volume larger. Right? In fact, if you take a deep breath in, you guys, and you, and you're, you go, and your thoracic cage expands, what about your lungs? Do your lungs expand with it? Yeah, they, your lungs get pulled on by the thoracic cage, right? So your lungs are also being pulled open, which means the volume inside your lungs is also increasing because your lungs are expanding with that thoracic cage. So if the volume's increasing, pressure decreases, and air flows from high to low pressure, which means that if your pressure is a little bit lower inside your lungs, that means the air is going to flow in because the air is going to flow from a higher pressure outside your body to lower pressure inside your lungs, right? And vice versa. Let's say if you exhale and you go, and your ribs contract, your lungs will also contract, and the, the volume is going to decrease. So what happens to pressure? Volume decreases. You get higher pressure, good. And if you have more pressure inside your lungs than outside your body, then air is going to flow from your lungs to the outside of the body, right, the atmosphere. So it flows out. And so when we talk about ventilation, it's all about changes in volume, which changes pressure, which then changes airflow in some way. And that's what we call Boyle's Law. So the relationship is that volume and pressure are inversely proportional. So if you decrease your volume, you increase pressure. Or if you increase volume, you decrease pressure. So um, there are some different muscles that are involved with breathing or ventilation because Inspiration or inhalation requires muscles to contract. So it actually takes force, it takes some energy to expand your thoracic cage. And this is done in a variety of ways. Not only does it expand outward, but it also expands inferiorly because your respiratory diaphragm will depress while it contracts. So it makes your volume of your thorax wider by also expanding inferiorly, not just outward. We'll see pictures of this here in a minute, guys. So the muscles that are involved in um, breathing include things like your respiratory diaphragm, your intercostal muscles, sternocleidomastoid on your neck, that's one of your accessory respiratory muscles, the scalenes on your neck as well, those are involved with forcible inspiration or inhalation. Um, otherwise, muscles like your pectoralis minor, erector spinae, abdominal muscles, transversus thoracis, which you find on your back, as well as serratus posterior, uh, inferior. Those are also involved with uh, breathing. So uh, this, this slide is showing all those different muscles. You guys can see this here. So here are the scalenes. They attach from your cervical vertebrae to your first and second ribs. Sternocleidomastoid is what connects to the mastoid process of your skull, as well as the sternum and clavicle. And so these muscles aid in inspiration because when they contract, it actually elevates your thoracic cage. But because this, this is also anchored to the respiratory diaphragm, it helps increase the volume of your thoracic cage because it elevates while the respiratory diaphragm depresses. And here's the diaphragm, by the way. The respiratory diaphragm is right here. We also have intercostal muscles. So intercostal muscles are the ones you find between ribs, and these are involved with inhalation, exhalation as well. Um, pectoralis minor plays a role, as well as some of the abdominal muscles and muscles of your spine or back here. Now, during inhalation and exhalation, the thoracic cavity changes in three dimensions. You get vertical, lateral, and anterior-posterior changes. The vertical changes result from the respiratory diaphragm moving, right? So 
your respiratory diaphragm back here, you guys, when it contracts, it depresses, which causes a vertical change in the thoracic volume. And it's actually going to be an increase in the thoracic volume because when this contracts, it depresses, which makes this volume larger in the thorax. Okay? The lateral changes result from the rib cage actually expanding or contracting. So the intercostal muscles can cause your rib cage, your thoracic cage, to expand outward or contract inward. That's due to the movement of those muscles between the ribs itself. Okay? And um, the anterior posterior changes result from the sternum moving anterior posteriorly by different muscles acting on that. In fact, looking at this slide here, we can see those changes um, on the thoracic cage. So what we see here is, are the events that lead up to um, inspiration or inhalation, right? So what happens is inspiratory muscles will contract during inhalation. So that includes your respiratory diaphragm and uh, some of your intercostal muscles. So your respiratory diaphragm will descend. As your rib, rib cage rises, that increases the volume inside your thoracic cage, uh, which also stretches the lungs. And as intrapulmonary pressure decreases because volume is increasing, air moves into the lungs. That makes sense, right? As the thoracic cage expands, the lungs are stretched with it. That increases the volume inside your lungs, which decreases pressure. But do you guys see this difference in pressure? It's negative one millimeter of mercury. So it's only one unit different than atmospheric pressure. That's not a big pressure difference, but it's enough to have air drawn inward towards your lungs, right? Down your airways. And so these gases will continue to, continue to flow until pressure is equal. In fact, when you inhale, you'll when air stops flowing, that's when pressures are equal, right? And the reason why they equalize is while air is flowing in. And then we exhale, it's actually an interesting process here, you guys, where the thoracic cage will um, just kind of recoil back to a resting shape. Now, what's interesting is that quiet exhalation or expiration does not require muscle contraction. The ribs and the diaphragm muscle, they're elastic enough to relax, bless you, relax back to a resting shape without any muscle contraction. So that exhalation doesn't require any muscles to contract. Like if you inhale, when you exhale, it just is a normal passive process. Unless you forcibly exhale, right? When you exhale, go, <gasps> right? That sounds bad, but. Um, <laughs> so these inspiratory muscles will, um, can relax, causing your ribcage to descend and recoil from your cartilage. Thoracic cavity volume decreases. And if your volume decreases, what happens to intrapulmonary pressure? Increases, good. So intrapulmonary pressure increases. You can see it's not much of a difference, just plus one millimeter of mercury with respect to atmospheric pressure. And then air would flow from where? If pressure's higher inside your lungs, where's air going to flow? Out of your airways into the atmosphere. Good. So that the air is going to flow out until the pressure gradient is zero. That's when air stops flowing. And so if I go back and forth in these slides, you guys can see inhalation, exhalation. So look at the ribs here. What's going on to our rib cage during inhalation? Yeah. What about exhalation? Yeah. So inhalation, exhalation. In, out. Right? So um, it's hard to tell here, you guys, but although this is during inhalation, the volume is actually increasing, not decreasing. And during exhalation, the volume is decreasing, which makes pressure larger. But remember, we're only looking at the lateral changes here. So laterally, it's expanding, and the sternum can kind of go outward a little bit. But remember, there's superior changes as well due to the respiratory diaphragm. So you can't really see that here as well. But if you look at the whole thoracic cage here, you can definitely tell this volume is less than this volume. So inhalation, exhalation, inhalation, exhalation, right? So during inhalation, is volume increasing or decreasing? Good. During inhalation, volume is increasing. And when volume increases, what happens to pressure? Decreases. Pressure in the lungs decreases. We call it intrapulmonary pressure. Decreases, which means that air pressure is higher outside your body and lower inside your lungs, so air is going to flow in to your airways, right? Remember, going back to the blood system, we talked about, um, or just, you know, cardiovascular system. We talked about how there's a respiratory pump, and that helps suck venous blood towards your thorax. It's the same process, except this is drawing air into your lungs, just like it's drawing venous blood up towards your heart, which is pretty cool. And then during exhalation, it's a passive process. These, the ribs will recoil back to a resting shape without you having to contract any muscles. Volume decreases which increases intrapulmonary pressure, and then air gets forced outward. 
So what if someone pushes on your chest? What if you're just laying there and someone pushes down your chest? What happens to intrapulmonary pressure? It increases because volume is decreasing. And what happens to air? You got it. It's forced out. It makes sense. If you guys ever, ever experienced that in some way, just you push on someone's chest, it's going to force air out. What about when they lift up off your chest and the ribs then expand back outward? Volume's increasing. Pressure is decreasing, so then air flows in. Good. Now you guys know the, the whole idea behind chest compressions, right? So chest compressions during CPR will not only affect blood flow, but also air flow. So as you push down someone's chest, you're decreasing the volume, increasing pressure, forcing air out. As you lift up on their chest, the ribs will expand back outward. Volume increases, pressure decreases, so air gets drawn in. But it's also influencing blood movement. Because as you push down their chest, pressure in the thoracic cavity increases, so blood's being forced away from the heart. And as you lift up on their chest, pressure in the thoracic cavity decreases, so blood's being drawn back to the heart. So chest compressions not only affect airflow, but also blood flow. Imagine this, you guys. So right in, out, in, out. So air and blood in, air and blood out. So you just imagine chest compressions here. So it makes sense. <laughs> All right, guys, so there's actually three factors that influence pulmonary ventilation. Remember, ventilation is airflow. There's three main factors here that affect pulmonary ventilation. That includes airway resistance, surface tension of your alveoli, as well as lung compliance. So going back to blood vessels, what were the factors that affected resistance of a blood vessel? Diameter. You got it. Vessel diameter. So what if I told you guys that airway diameter is the same thing? So if your airway <laughs> diameter is wider, resistance is lower, so airflow is higher. Or what about if your airway diameter is decreased, it's more constricted? Increased resistance and decreased flow. You got it. Cool. So um, that's airway resistance. Now, there's other factors too, you guys, like the viscosity of air. It's kind of weird to think about. But that, that does exist. Like air can be thicker and more viscous. You know, air at Denver is thinner than air at sea level. So if you have a pulmonary condition, it's going to be easier to breathe where the air is thinner, right? Because then um, it's, it, there's less resistance to flow, right? Otherwise, let's say if you had like emphysema and you lived in a humid climate at sea level, well, that air is thicker. It's going to be more difficult to breathe. And I've heard people describe it as like having a, like a, um, a washcloth over their mouth where it's so difficult to breathe, it's like they're trying to breathe through a washcloth because there's so much resistance to flow. So um, although there's kind of a trade-off, right? Because in Denver, where the air is thinner, there's also a lower concentration of oxygen, mm -hmm. which means you've got to breathe more often just to get the same amount of oxygen. So it's interesting. Um, what about surface tension, you guys? Well, surface tension of the alveoli is reduced by surfactant. Now, what if your alveoli were <laughs> collapsed because there was surface tension and the walls were sticky, and the alveoli of all your lungs was all collapsed. Would that make it more difficult or easier to breathe? More difficult. Yeah, more difficult, absolutely. Because that means every time you inhale, it would take extra force just to pop open those alveoli because they're stuck together. So that reducing surface tension of alveoli also improves pulmonary ventilation or airflow, as well as lung compliance. Lung compliance means the stretchability of lungs. Remember how we said the lungs follow the thorax? If the thorax expands, the lungs expand. Well, the degree of compliance refers to the stretchability of those lungs. Like, if your thorax expands, how well do your lungs follow? If they follow really well, then they're very compliant. If they don't follow very well, then they're not compliant. So you imagine then that factors that affect lung compliance would decrease pulmonary ventilation. Well, imagine if you expand your thoracic cage, but your lungs didn't follow that fast. They kind of slowly expanded with the thoracic cage. It would be much more difficult to breathe because they have a slower expansion of those lungs. That's compliance. Stretchability of lungs. Lung compliance is affected by things like alveolar surface tension, um, the extensibility of your rib cage, as well as lung tissue itself. So um, airway resistance is, is um, inversely proportional to flow, right? So if you decrease resistance, what happens to flow? Increases, right? If you if you increase resistance, decrease. then you decrease flow. And resistance relates to airway diameter for the most part, right? I mean, you, you can talk about air, the viscosity of air or the length of the airway, but the most important factor for to resistance is the diameter of that airway. 
So if you bronchodilate, you make your airway diameter wider, that means there's less resistance, so you get more flow. That makes sense. Or if you bronchoconstrict and you make that airway diameter less, then you increase resistance and decrease flow. All right, good. So that the gas flow changes inversely with resistance. That makes sense. Now, delta P, by the way, is the change in pressure. But let's imagine this delta P doesn't change. Look, I mean, well, it should, right? Because that's how air flows. So air only flows from high to low pressure, right? So delta P is that difference in pressure. But the difference in pressure is only part of the story. It also relates to resistance. So if you have a large difference in pressure, but also high resistance, then you'll actually have less flow. If you had a large difference in pressure, but low resistance, then you'd have the maximal amount of flow. So what causes this change in pressure, like the difference in pressure between your lungs and atmosphere? Volume, good. So we, we can modify this equation and somehow put volume in this up here, right? Because pressure and volume are also inversely proportional. So what happens if you increase volume? You decrease pressure. If you, if you increase volume, you decrease pressure, right? And it's that change in volume that changes our pressure. And we need that change in pressure for flow to occur. And that makes sense because air only flows from high to low pressure. What if our pressures are matched? Delta P is zero, right? If delta P were zero, what would F be? Flow. It would also be zero. Yeah, it would also be zero. Exactly. So it would make sense that you need a change in pressure for flow to be there because if you don't, then our, our delta P is zero, then that makes our flow zero. That, you know, it makes sense with respect to this equation, but I also think intuitively it makes sense because you need differences in pressure for movement, right, air to flow. So air only flows from high to low pressure, whether that pressure is higher inside your lungs or outside your body. Now, uh, what this slide has shown you guys is how, how resistance changes across your airway. Remember, your lower respiratory tract has a conducting zone and respiratory zone. The conducting zone will be like your larynx, your trachea, your bronchi, and all of your larger bronchi, even bronchioles. And the respiratory zone starts at the respiratory bronchiole, alveolar duct, and alveoli, right? If you guys notice here, our resistance decreases over the length of our airway beyond the medium-sized bronchi. So as resistance decreases, what happens to flow then? It increases, right? So air flow is really, really fast in this distal part of the conducting zone. But if you guys notice here that our resistance is actually pretty low in the respiratory zone so that we get a lot of airflow in the respiratory zone because resist resistance is so low. But that's also dependent on the change in pressure. That's not shown here, though, but it's an interesting thing to keep in mind. So um, you guys may have heard of people taking like epinephrine for anaphylaxis or, or septic shock, right? Well, with anaphylactic shock, not only does it affect your blood vessels, but also affects your airways. Remember how you might get uh, constriction of your airways from that from an anaphylaxis um, or an allergy, right? Where your airways start to kind of close up. Now, the effect of epinephrine is that epinephrine, as a sympathetic hormone, binds to beta two receptors in the smooth muscle of your airways. That causes relaxation of the muscle, which then would bronchodilate. So epinephrine, although it's a sympathetic hormone, it actually inhibits the smooth muscle of your airways and causes bronchodilation. If you bronchodilate, what happens to resistance along your airway? Decreases. Decreases. What happens to air flow? Decreases. You got it. Increases flow. That's exactly what this is saying here, guys. So epinephrine, like if you do like an EpiPen or something, right? So someone's in anaphylaxis, you give an EpiPen, mm -hmm. uh, injects epinephrine in their body. It's like synthetic epinephrine, but it has the same effect. Binds to beta-2 receptors in your lungs, causes smooth muscle relaxation in your lungs, in airways, which dilates the airways, which reduces resistance and therefore increases flow. That way someone doesn't just die of respiratory failure. That's definitely possible with anaphylaxis. Okay. So uh, if you're injecting someone with epinephrine, what's that also going to do to their heart rate? Yeah, yeah it's going to increase their heart rate. So yeah, you might cause your airway to open up, but it's also going to cause their heart rate, heart to start racing. You guys may have heard of uh, albuterol before. They put like inhalers, like non-steroidal inhalers, like albuterol. Um, albuterol is a beta-2 agonist. It makes these beta-2 receptors more sensitive. So using your body's own existing epinephrine, it makes these beta-2 receptors more sensitive, which has the same effect. You're still going to bronchodilate, which re reduces resistance and increases airflow. That's the whole idea behind you know, inhaling that, that substance, albuterol. So it's kind of cool. Um,
We also talked about how alveolar surface tension affects airflow because um, surfactant is what reduces that surface tension. So we said that alveoli were microscopically small and they have a mucus layer on the inside. Now, if those alveoli are, if the mucus were attracted because of, um, you know, water cohesion, then the alveoli might have a tendency to want to collapse, which means it would be difficult for you to breathe because if they're not already open, it's going to take extra force to snap open those alveoli. So could you guys imagine if all your alveoli were collapsed in your lungs, it would take a lot of force just to inhale and open up those airways just long enough to get air to flow in, but when you exhaled, they'd snap back shut again. Okay. Now, the reason why we, that, that doesn't happen in us is that we make normally a, a, su a sufficient amount of pulmonary surfactant. The function of surfactant is that it helps reduce surface tension of water. An example of surfactant, by the way, is soap. Soap is also surfactant. It's a detergent, and it helps break apart the surface tension of water to help clean your dishes and stuff like that. I won't go into the chemistry of that, but uh, your body makes its own natural surfactant in your alveoli. The type 2 cells make this, and that surfactant reduces surface tension enough to prevent the cohesion of your alveolar walls, and it keeps those alveoli open, which actually aids in the ease of ventilation. You know, if the alveoli are already patent or open, it's easy for air to flow in and out of your lungs, right? Otherwise, if they're closed and collapsed due to a lack of surfactant, it's much more difficult to breathe. An example where you'd find this, you guys, is infant respiratory distress syndrome, or IRDS. Uh, this is common in uh, premature births, where if someone is uh, born too prematurely and they're not ready to start making pulmonary surfactant, that means that their airways will be collapsed, sticky, which means it's much more difficult for them to breathe. And once you're outside of the mother's womb, you're expected your lungs need to start working on their own, right? That's You're not getting oxygenated blood from the placenta anymore. You have to get that from your lungs. So um, infant respiratory distress syndrome is, uh, you know, current, is, a, is a deficiency of, of pulmonary surfactant. But there are medical interventions to this. Like there's different drugs that can increase the amount of surfactant production. Now, uh, lung compliance refers to the stretchability of lungs, right? How movable are they? Remember, we said that the lungs follow your thoracic wall. So if your thoracic wall expands during, during inhalation, your lungs should comply and expand very well with the wall, right? Well, if they're less compliant, that means they're less stretchable, less movable, which means that you have less airflow, right? Like, if you, let's say if you can expand your thoracic wall, but your, your lungs don't move with the wall as well. That means they're not expanding, which means you're not changing the volume as well, which means you're not changing pressure, which means air is not flowing. So it's kind of interesting. So if your lungs are more compliant, then it's easier to expand your lungs. And normally lungs are very well compliant because they have a lot of elastic tissue. They don't have a lot of collagen or like, you know, tough fibers in there. And um, normally you make enough pulmonary surfactant. If you didn't have a sufficient amount of pulmonary surfactant, your lungs would be less compliant because they're sticking to each other internally, right? If your airways were stuck to each other on the inside, it's more difficult to expand your lung tissue because it's all stuck together internally um, due to that lack of surfactant. But if you have a sufficient amount of surfactant, it decreases alveolar surface tension so that your airways aren't stuck together, they remain open and therefore more stretchable because they're not sticky internally. Okay, That's lung compliance. So it's diminished by like non-elastic scar tissue, um, less surfactant production, or decreased flexibility of the thoracic cage. What do you guys think might cause this to occur? Like if um, if the thoracic cage is less flexible, what might cause that? Yeah, if it can't expand, right? But what, what might cause that though? Yeah, like a broken rib. What if that broken rib heals back improperly and is now less movable as a result? That can happen. Or what if your costal cartilage starts to calcify and harden from like excessive uh, trauma? That can also decrease the, the flexibility of the thoracic cage. Or what about paralysis of respiratory muscles? Like if your respiratory muscles get paralyzed from, from some sort of condition, that also makes your thoracic cage less flexible. So things to keep in mind. Now we'll go into more disorders. By the way, these are all categories of diseases. And we'll talk about all these categories of diseases, like non-elastic scar tissue, surfactant production, as well as decreases in flexibility of the thoracic cage. All of that's in pathophysiology later. So we'll